Uh, welcome once again to uh, Lord Mayhem Reading. We are currently on online page 2533 in the year 1946. And Eva, go ahead and start the reading for us. Krishna returned the shawl and coat to Baba, who put them on. Krishna wondered what work was being done since Baba had another coat with him. He refused to wear the clean coat, insisting upon putting this one back on. And they returned to Naran Jaipur from Hardwar. After a week, Baba sent Krishna back to Hardwar to see Nanga Baba and present him with flowers and a cup of water. When Krishna reached the place, he found a large crowd collected around Nanga Baba's dead body. <clears throat> he had died that very morning. A devotee of the must remarked to Krishna that the day before, Nanga Baba had said, my work is done, I am going now. And this suddenly reminded Krishna of what Nanga Baba had uttered before Baba, now release me. Krishna bowed to Nanga Baba, placed the flowers on his body, sprinkled the water over it, and returned to Naranjapur. In May 1946, Baba and Erich traveled to Batala to contact Lahori Baba, an exceptional but extremely restless must sitting only a few minutes in any one place. On seeing Baba, the naked must ran away and Baba pursued him. He rushed from his abode in a sweeper's colony to an outdoor cabin, similar to a highway tow booth, <clears throat> where Baba contacted him. While Baba was sitting with him, Lahori Baba was overcome with emotion and burst out crying, then suddenly stood up and walked away. Baba came back to Naranjanpur, not, not entirely satisfied with the contact. Accompanied by Mehera, Mani, Meru, and Rano, Baba left Dehradun for Kulu Valley on Wednesday, 29 May, where it was much cooler than Naranjanpur. Baidu, Kaka, Erich, and Don were also with him. On the way, Baba stopped at Bat Batala to contact Lahori Baba for a second time. The must took off and began running through the fields and Baba chased after him. After running almost 10 miles, the must finally stopped and sat down. The must allowed Baba to approach and sit with him. The contact was satisfactory and Baba was pleased. Afterward, the group traveled to Pathankot, where Baba worked with the chargemen of the city. Bengali Baba on the 30th. The saintly must was held in great reference by the local people. They arrived in Mandi on 1 June. On the 3rd, they reached Katrain in a small cottage in Kulu Valley at the foothills of the Himalayas. Baba contacted a subtle yogi in Baragran during his stay. They met in silence in the yogi's mountain hut, but mostly Baba remained absorbed in his seclusion work. Rano had not been well in Naranjanpur, and in Katrain, she felt weaker and more indisposed. 
Baba was feeding her with his own hands and looking after her with care. He remarked to her, I brought you here to look after my requirements, but now I have to look after yours. It's my bad luck, Rano replied. <clears throat> Not bad luck, Baba corrected. It's your good luck, don't worry. In Bondi, Baba had told her to eat a plate of curry and rice. Rano felt nauseated, but obeyed and later vomited. And examined her and found she had infectious hepatitis. She was kept in a separate room at the top of a cow shed and Don began treating her. Don would tell her to eat all sorts of appetizing things, but Baba forbade each new request. Rano improved quickly and Baba later revealed, if I had not ordered you to eat the curry and rice, you would have been very sick. Leaving Katrine on Thursday, 20 June, 1946, Baba took the women to Manali and then to Raysan, where they spent the night at a hotel. From Raysan, they went to Palampur, where an amusing incident took place. A goat was caught eating Baba's soap. From Palampur, they entrained to Saharanpur, and from there went back to Naranjanpur, which they reached on 22 June. Dr. Ghani had a wife and children to support, but he never paid much attention to his homeopathic practice. And by 1946, he had fallen deeply into debt. While he had stayed in Bangalore with Baba in 1940, some unscrupulous unscru persons in Lanavla had falsely involved him in a murder case. The case was taken to court where it dragged on for years. Ghani had to spend a lot of money on lawyers for his defense. And because of this, he had incurred substantial debts. His acquittal came sooner than expected and he attributed it to the night in Bangalore when he had first disclosed to Baba his troubles. Baba was in seclusion at the time and Ghani was on night watch. Baba asked him, what are you thinking? Baba told him every detail of the false charges being brought against him. Baba replied, you should have told me before. Where was the necessity of getting scared and going into debt? The whole thing is stuffless. Those who have involved you will themselves get entrapped. You will go free. And that is exactly what finally transpired. Ghani was acquitted and the accusers became the accused and were found guilty of the murder. Ghani wrote this news to Baba and asked what to do to clear his debts. Baba thought of a scheme he called the Boja Burden Fund. In fact, Baba sub subsequently sent Don to England and America to collect enough money to pay off Ghani's debts. One day, Kaka and Erich were riding in a Tonga on their way from Dehradun Railway Station to Naranjanpur when they saw an old man who looked to them like a must. They took him in the Tonga, thinking Baba would like to contact the man and return to Baba's bungalow. 
When the tanga reached the gate, the old man explained, I have come to the garden of roses. Baba came out and their eyes met. Baba's eyes were lustrous. And the old man gazed fixedly at him. He began to laugh so hard that tears of joy rolled down his cheeks. The must then turned to Kaka and Erich and declared, look at this man's face and forehead. They shine as if the sun were there. Can't you recognize who he is? Baba took the must by the hand and led him inside the hut where they sat together for about 15 minutes. And could still be heard laughing in ecstasy. After the cutting, Baba came out with the must and led him toward the house. The must saw a brass bell hanging by the gardener's hut, and he took it and began dancing in a circle around Baba, ringing the bell over his own head and Baba's. When Baba had taken him inside for a little while, the must announced, God has sent me today to this Parsi saint. Baba then brought him back to the hut where he again sat with him for half an hour. Before sending him back to Dehradun, Baba gave him 10 rupees. And oddly, the must insisted on writing down Baba's address. After the must left, Baba remarked that he was on the fifth plane. Jalpai left for Pune on 30 June, 1946. On 2 July, Baba met with Kaka and Erich for must work in Ajmer. Wishing to work with Maz, Majzu Chacha again, Baba had a kettle, cup, and saucer brought along to ply him with tea and to keep him in a happy mood. But, but this time, Chacha surprised them by asking for bread and mutton, which were brought to him. Baba sat with Chacha for an hour and a half and was very satisfied with the inner work done. After visiting other places on route, Baba returned to Naranjanpur about 12 days later. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Keki Nalavala had the opportunity of coming into Baba's close contact at this time. During his stay in Naranjanpur, Baba permitted Keki to visit daily. <clears throat> One day, Baba instructed him to bring five needy, former middle-class people, those who had suffered some misfortune, but who found it difficult to seek help because of their upbringing. Keki searched everywhere and found that almost everyone he met was needy. He was nervous of making a mistake but at last managed to choose five. And he brought them to Baba in a tanga. In a closed room, Baba washed their feet and gave them prasad in the form of money. After they had gone, Baba explained to Keki, the whole world is needy, but I wanted to contact those people who are helpless, yet do not beg. Adi Sr. was called to Naranjanpur from Ahmednagar on 19 July, 1946. Baba left for Hardwar on the 24th with Adi, Kaka, Baidu, and Erich. They stayed on the fourth floor of a small hotel. Baba sent Erich and Baidu to scout out the area for suitable must contacts. 
They were also sent to Rishikesh on the 26th, but returned disappointed, explaining that one good must had left for some distant place. Despite that, Baba rose early on Saturday morning, 27 July, 1946, and left for Rishikesh with the Mandali in a crowded public bus. It was monsoon season and the Ganges was flooded by the heavy rains. A number of sadhus were contacted in Rishikesh but not even one was advanced. As Adi noted in his diary, Baba gets peeved because the trip serves no useful purpose. They later returned to Hadwar and Baba decided to proceed to um, Amritsar for further must contacts. They boarded a train that evening and were surprised to find plenty of empty seats in a military compartment. But before the train left, the conductor came and told them to move to another compartment, as this one was reserved for military personnel only. The train was about to leave, and the other compartments were already overcrowded. There were hardly half a dozen soldiers in the military compartment, and they had no objection to Baba's remaining, so they stayed where they were. But after the train stopped at Warki in Saharanapur, the compartment filled to overflowing. Tempers rose as each soldier tried to make a place for himself. Before too long, there was a near riot in the speeding train. Bayonet bayonets were brandished and hockey sticks were swung. Pandemonium broke out. Suddenly, there was a loud clap and everyone turned to see Baba standing on one of the wooden seats. The effect was instantaneous, Erich remembered, though I do not know how it could have been heard in that raucous din. The soldier stopped fighting and stared up at Baba, who had raised his hands for them to cease. In his flowing white sadra, it seemed as if the darkness of their frenzy was displayed by the rays of light issuing from his robe. They were mystified by his glowing countenance. Their wrath subsided and their hearts were eased by a soothing calmness. Baba then smiled and his smile completely dissipated their anger. Baba dictated a short message on his board which Erich read out. It is not good to fight among yourselves. It will not solve anything. You are soldiers and the safety of our country rests on your shoulders. If you start fighting among yourselves, how will you safeguard the interests of the nation? Your fighting should be reserved for the protection of the country's citizens. The entire country trusts you. And if you betray this trust, then how will you protect the lives of your brothers and sisters? You are all brothers and brothers should not fight. Now sit down. <clears throat> Baba's words had a, had a salubrious effect and all sat down. Baba promised everyone tea at the next station and told Erich to break open the tin of sweets, which they had with them. At the next station, the tea was brought and Baba distributed it and the sweets with his own hands to every soldier. 
the murderous atmosphere of minutes before turned into one of camaraderie. Sitting among them, Baba talked with each through Erich and asked the soldiers to narrate their experiences in the war. However, finding it increasingly difficult to continue traveling in the same train, Baba and the men got down at Ambala. Kaka and Adi were told to go to Simla and gather information about mosques and their locations there. On Sunday, 28 July, 1946, Baba Baidu and Erich left by another train for Amritsar where they stayed in a dock bungalow. From there, Baba went to the village of Virka to contact the fifth plane Wally. Tali sign. The Wally was a short old man, a slipper on one foot and other foot bare. How about another reader? Marvin, would you like to read? Oh, yeah. I was talking, but I realized I was muted. Oh, okay. I asked if Rosa wanted to read. Um, I don't know if she's there. She she but, has a hard time with her eyes. Oh, 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 right, right. Okay, let me take over. In one hand, he held a, he held a tree branch. He seemed to make it bigger. Okay, good. In one hand, he held a tree branch, and in the other, a bundle with a Koran in it. Baba brought some plums for the must, Tali Sain. However, handed them back, the must hand them back, and told the Tonga driver to take Baba back to Amritsar. Amritsar. When Baba sent Erich to ask the Wali what should be done with the plums, Tali Sain replied, the one who has given them knows best what to do with them. Baba was not satisfied with the contact and so returned to Amritsar the next morning to see Tali Sain. It had rained heavily throughout the night and they found him sitting in a pool of water and mud. Baba gently pulled him out and cleaned him. When the must's hut was dried, Baba sat there alone with him for half an hour. Baba then left happy with the contact, indicating that his work had now been satisfactorily completed. In Mirut, on 1st August, Baba contacted the chargeman of the city, Meherban Baba, a fifth plane must living in the cremation ground. The must, who kept 10 or 12 dogs with him, was a Jalali type and appeared ill-tempered. But to those who dared to approach him, he would utter, Meherban, meaning gracious friend. In Bal Balandarshar, the same day, Baba worked with an advanced soul who was employed in an office. He would not usually meet people in his office, but as a result of Erich's persuasion, he agreed, and Baba contacted him there. On the second, Baba left for Saran Saranpur, where he had previously contacted musts, I communed again with the six plain saint, Rema, Rematula. At midnight, Baba returned to Ambala. The next day, they went to Pinjar, where Baba contacted a very high musk called Bhagwan Nath. He was nearly naked, carrying bundles of rags, and had a mild but restless disposition. Baba found him quite suitable for his work. Baba then went to Kalka, where he contacted the must Mabu Baba, who for many years had sat on the veranda of a liquor store. Baba also contacted, contacted Sadhu Nath, about whom Baba commented that he was sincere. On Monday, 4th August, 1946, Baba, Baidu, and Erich traveled in a rented car and arrived midday at the Royal Hotel in Simla, 
where they met Kaka and Adi Sr. Baba seemed tired, and Erich and Baidul looked haggard. Baba remarked to Adi, This trip has been the most exhausting excursion I have ever undertaken. During Baba's three-day stay in the mountain town of Simla, he worked with the Mohammedan Musk, who was sometimes a Jalali, or fiery, and at other times a Jamali, serene type. Baba also worked with a, a gory Baba, a six-plane saint. He was an impressive and powerful-looking man with fiery eyes and was known to be abusive. The must saint stayed at the house of a Sikh who greatly revered him. The must had taken over the entire veranda of the house, filling it with filth and rubbish and actually blocking the front entrance, making it impossible to enter the house from the front door. The Sikh, not wishing to disturb a gory Baba, had built a ladder to another entrance so as not to trespass through the must's territory. <laughs> when they went to contact him, a gory Baba pointed to Baba and remarked, Do you know who he is? You will see what will come to pass, and one day know who he really is. One must was brought to the hotel where Baba contacted him. For the most part, Baba had to walk miles in the steep terrain to make his contacts. <clears throat> it was drizzling, and the journey was tiresome. Baba is tired owing to the cumulative effect of traveling and hardship, Adi recorded. On Wednesday, 7th August, Baba and the men left Simla a day early for Ambala. They had to change buses at Gagar, and Baba felt giddy while walking across a railway bridge. Adi Sr. held his hand to help him across. They reached Umbala that night and slept well in the dock bungalow, although it was hot and humid. Early the next morning, Kaka was sent to Dehradun with Baba's instructions for Vishnu to meet them at Hardwar. Meanwhile, Baba communed with Tophanalawala, Baba, who was a tall, dark-skinned, naked must. He lived in an open field in all seasons, surrounded by a pack of a dozen dogs whom he fed before he ate his own food. He was respected by the cattle and goat herders who would have tea with him when invited. They then left for Barara, which was reached at 10 a.m. After a simple meal of rice and dal, they set out in a bus for Sadhora and Nahan. There was only one bus the whole day, and consequently it was jammed with passengers. Baba and Adi had to squeeze in front with the driver. The roads were muddy and slippery due to rains, and they had to drive through many creeks and streams. Finally, they reached Sadhora after an hour and a half. Baba tried to contact two musts, but was unsuccessful. They continued by the same bus to Nahan, arriving at night. Baba went out the next day, 9th of August, 1946, with Baidu and Erich. <clears throat> it was raining, but they continued searching for a naked must, supposedly living in a cemetery. This must was also known as Agori Baba. The cemetery was located at the bottom of a small valley, and Baba had to climb down the slippery side of a muddy slope in the torrential rain to contact him. The efforts were worthwhile because this must was advanced, and Baba expressed that his contact was satisfactory. They left <clears throat> Nahan the following afternoon and reached Sadhora the same evening. Baba walked until past midnight in search of his beloved musts and contacted two interesting ones. The first, Dinasha, was a high must who appeared to be continually in a dazed state. Somehow the must had eluded Baba the whole night. They finally found him, but after communing with him, Baba was not completely satisfied with the contact. He ordered Erich and Baidul go back to him at four in the morning and pay your respects. Observe closely whether the must turns his head to the left or to the right. 
or looks directly at you and report back to me. Unfortunately, Erich and Baidu were exhausted and did not get up until 5.30 that morning. Although Baba was upset, he forgave them and abandoned the idea of contacting the must further. The other remarkable contact made in Sodhora was an adept pilgrim called Krishna. The man had worked as a guard at the railway station, but was so absorbed in Lord Krishna, he would write Radha Krishna on walls wherever he went and constantly uttered these two names aloud. Once, Krishna was so engrossed and enraptured in offering devotional bhajans, he failed to show up for work on time and the train left without him. However, some people actually saw him on the train, while others claimed he had been singing bhajans the whole day. To corroborate the facts, they went to his supervisor, who brought out the duty book and found that the guard's signature had been signed at every station. When asked about this strange occurrence, the guard offered this explanation. Lord Krishna looked after my worldly duties while I was busy praying to him. Thus the guard was called Krishna, and he subsequently retired and spent his whole time contemplating his beloved Lord Krishna. Baba heard the must chanting Krishna Krishna and hurried out into the road. When Krishna saw Baba hurrying toward him, instantly he began running toward Baba. When they met, they embraced with such intensity that they fell down and rolled together on the road, locked in a tight embrace. Krishna wept when he held Baba, and Baba appeared very happy to have contacted him. The must's one-pointed love for his beloved Krishna, said age, drew the divine embrace of the incarnate Krishna, who pierced his heart until it would not stop bleeding. With only a few hours sleep, Baba and his companions left Sarhora early in the morning on, August, on Sunday, 11th August, 1946. Curiously enough, they met the must Dinasha on the road as they were leaving, and so Baba was able to contact him again, although still not to his full satisfaction. They took the bus to Barara and then a train to Saharanpur. After lunch, they continued by train to Hardwar, arriving in the evening. They slept in the waiting room at the station, but did not get much sleep because of all the noise in the adjoining canteen and on the crowded platform. They left Hardwar for Rishikesh on the morning of the 12th and stayed there at the Dak Bungalow for six days. Don had returned to England at the end of July 1946, not only with instructions from Baba about Ghani's Boja Fund, but also with word that Baba might come to the West now that World War II was over. On 13 August 1946, Baba sent this telegram to Don in London. Inform and impress Elizabeth Narina that my coming depends on my return from the Himalayas, which work might delay and postpone my coming for a month or two. Margaret should ac accept any temporary work. Elizabeth was particularly anxious for Baba to stay at the new center in Myrtle Beach, and Alexander Markey and Jean Adriel were also eager to have Baba visit them in California. <clears throat> Correspondence in this regard had been going back and forth for some time. Don went to America, arriving on the 25th of August and returned to India a few weeks later. At Rishikesh, Baba and his men spent every day looking for musts. Their days were filled with hardships. As Baba, Baidul, Erich, Kaka, and Adi Sr. roamed about, walking for hours in the hot sun or rain, and fording the Ganges almost daily. Once when the waters had risen too high, they were only able to cross on an elephant. They covered a radius of 20 to 25 miles around Rishikesh, and in all, Baba contacted 500 sadhus and 67 musts 
and saints. One particularly, particularly significant contact in Rishikesh was a highly advanced soul called Jala Tapasvi. This great yogi wore a green kafni and sat on the roof of a ruined temple which had once stood on an island in the Ganges River, but was now submerged. When Kaka and Erich first went to him, they introduced themselves as Parsis from Bombay, and the yogi at once asked, how are things there? There are constant riots and disturbances, Erich replied. Jala Tapasvi surprised them by stating, it is natural and indeed inevitable. It is all the work of the avatar, who is now in form. How can we find the avatar, Erich asked. No one knows him, the yogi said, but he is already born. I know it. He moves amongst humanity incognito, unknown. People like Gandhi, the great men of the world, the so-called leaders, may be famous and even worshipped by mankind, but they are mere playthings in the hands of the avatar. They are like kites, the strings of which are held firmly in the avatar's grasp, and he controls them as he wishes. Hitler shook the world, everyone says so, but it is the avatar who worked through him. When will the avatar manifest? After 22 years, which would be 1968. These wars and disturbances will continue until then, and three quarters of humanity will be wiped out. This Narakwasi, or hell-like world, will continue, and then a Swargawasi, heaven-like world, will be born. For how can people of hell coexist with the residents of heaven? 75% of the present world will perish, and the remaining one-fourth will be absorbed in the qualities of a new world where peace and happiness will reign. Jala Tapasvi concluded, like other avatars before him, he will be ridiculed by the majority of people and his real fame will only spread after his death when he will be recognized and worshipped as the savior. As usual, Erich and Kaka had not once referred to Mayor Baba, but when Jala Tapasvi later saw Baba in a house in Rishikesh, he cried out, the avatar has come. Baba was happy with the contact. There were many strange characters in Rishikesh, but one whose name is not recorded is noteworthy, though contact with him was not to Baba's satisfaction. He was a foreboding, strange recluse who was well known, but whose whereabouts in Rishikesh no one dared to divulge for fear of being cursed. Erich, after much inquiry, found this recluse who had closeted himself in a hut on the riverbank in Rishikesh. When the recluse asked who he was bringing, Erich replied, my father. Baba arrived, but the contact was not to his liking, because during it, the recluse tested Baba with inane questions such as, how many sons besides this one, meaning Erich, do you have? As a young man, this seeker was said to have wandered through the jungles for years, living only on leaves and roots before settling in Rishikesh. He was emaciated since he ate only one chapati and a little dal daily. Nevertheless, he was a forbidding character if angered. Several years before, while Baba was staying in Dehradun in 1942, the following incident occurred involving Krishna Nair. Baba's night watchman at the time, Krishna would take a walk every evening at five o'clock before going to Baba's room for a night watch. Opposite their bungalow was a girl's school. Four girls used to watch Krishna, and one of them asked him if she could come with him for a walk. Krishna felt extremely uncomfortable around women. I, did, I didn't want to see any woman's face, he recounted. I disliked women. 
His disgust was so great that when the girl innocently asked to accompany him, he spit in her face. The girl's feelings were hurt, and she complained to Baba. Baba called Krishna and asked for his side of the story. You have done a terrible thing, Baba reprimanded. He directed the girl to remove her sandal and slap Krishna with it. Krishna was ordered to bow down to her and seek her forgiveness. When the girl left, Baba asked Krishna why he did that. Krishna said, Baba, I do not want to touch any woman. I do not want to have any contact with any woman. Baba spelled out to him, you say you do not want to have anything to do with women, but you will marry. You will have one son. Also, he will cry when he cries. Who will look after him? No, Baba, I will not marry. Are you challenging me? Baba asked him. I am not challenging you, but I do not want to marry. You will marry, Baba. You will marry, Baba insisted. Krishna was equally firm that he, he had resolved not to wed. All right, Baba directed him. Write it down. Krishna took out a pencil, but Baba stopped him. He called Vishnu and told him to bring a quill pen. He then directed Nilu to draw blood from Krishna's forefinger. To Krishna, he ordered, write in your own blood, I will not marry. When Krishna finished, Baba examined the paper and handed it to Vishnu. Keep this with you, and when I ask for it again, give it to me, Baba instructed. Four years passed. Nothing was said again about Krishna's marriage. Prior to traveling to Niranjanpur in July 1946, Baba had given Krishna a month's leave to visit his mother. Don't disappoint your mother, Baba ordered him. Obey her words and make her happy. <clears throat> Krishna went home and saw his family for the first time in nine years. And we have a footnote here. Since 1939, Baba had been sending Krishna Nair's mother 30 rupees every month to help with her livelihood, which she continued to do until her death in 1964. After four or five days, his mother began pestering him to marry. Krishna remembered Baba's words and sent him a letter. Baba sent a one-line te telegram, Obey your mother's words. Krishna's mother arranged the marriage, and the marriage ceremony was held 12 days later. The very next morning, a telegram came from Baba, ordering Krishna to return immediately. His bride was not upset. On the contrary, she insisted that he go. Krishna met Baba in Rishikesh. When Krishna entered the room, everyone was ordered out. Baba asked Krishna, are you married? Is your wife beautiful? Does she love you? Krishna says, Baba, I was with her for only eight hours. How do I know whether or not she loves me? <laughs> Baba commented, she is better than you. She loves you more than you know. Krishna was sent back to Naranjanpur with instructions not to tell anyone about the marriage. Meanwhile, from the dock bungalow in Mishikesh, Baba wanted to proceed to Uttar Kashi for must work. Baidul and Erich spent their full time and energy preparing for the journey, arranging foodstuffs and coolies, and drawing up an itinerary. But it was learned that because of breaches in the road, it would be virtually impossible to venture there at this time. The trip was therefore abandoned, and instead, Baba sent Baidu and Erich to look for a bungalow nearby where they could stay. The non-stop must trip without adequate rest or food was straining everyone's health. Although Baba looked as fresh as ever, Kaka was tired, Erich was overworked, Baidul's feet ached, and Ali Sr. never stopped grumbling about the poor quality of food. If a bungalow could be found, life would be somewhat more normal, since the must could be brought there for Baba to contact. They found a house between Hardwar and Jawalapur. Baba approved it and moved there on Sunday, 18th August, 1946. They soon discovered why the so-called garden house had been vacant and so easily available. It was infested with pests. 
They cleaned the cobwebs off the walls and had the whole house whitewashed. They also sprayed DDT pesticide in every room, but bed bugs took refuge in their cots, making sleep impossible. On the 19th and 20th, Kaka walked more than a quarter of a mile for food. Erich plotted miles for marketing. Baidul kept up his tramps for musts, and Adi labored over building a fire to prepare their tea and meals. As his inner work intensified, Baba began fasting at this time, eating only one meal a day at 6 p.m. Eva, would you like to read a page or two? Sure, sure, of go, course. Go right ahead. Baba slept little on the night of 21 August due to his universal work. The next day, he continued the spiritual work by going into seclusion in his room for three hours and then walking up and down the back veranda. Kaka began cooking rice and dal once a day for himself and Adi, and Adi did the marketing in Erich's absence. Baidul and Erich left for Saharanapur on the 22nd to collect poor people for a specific day according to Baba's instructions, and to look for musts, if any resided there. They returned at 10 p.m. on the night of the 23rd with the sixth plane must saint, Ramatula Baba. Baba had worked with Ramatula several times before. The must wore tattered clothing and seemed to recognize Baba because he touched Baba's feet as soon as he entered the house. Baba did not like this the least. The must spent the night on the veranda, but in the morning they discovered he had disappeared. After an hour's laborious search, they found Rhett Matula at the train station and brought him back. Baba communed with him and then sent him back to Saharanapur with Baidu and Erich with instructions to bring another must. On Sunday, 25 August, 1946, Baba continued to remain in seclusion for three hours. Late that night, Erich and Baidu brought a high must from Pinjar named Bhagwan Nath, the Mela or Fair for Sadhus at Hardwar was in progress at the time. So only first class tickets could be purchased. Thus, Erich Baidu and the filthy, nearly naked must Bhagwan Nath entered the first class compartment against the vehement protests of the other passengers. After arriving at the bungalow with Bhagwan Nath, Baba instructed each of the four men to keep a careful watch over the must in shifts of two hours each throughout the night. This was done, but the next morning when they were otherwise occupied, the must ran away. Amazingly, they found him nine miles away in Hardwar. After the escapade, Erich and Baidul returned to Saharanapur to finalize details of the upcoming poor program. Baba finished working with the must sooner than expected and directed Adi Sr. to arrange to have the must escorted back to Pinjar. Adi found a man willing to accompany Bhagwan Nath and then booked them bus reservations. But after traveling only 12 miles, the man returned with the must, saying the must had gotten off the bus, refused to reboard it, and was generally unmanageable. 
Bhagwan Nath was therefore kept at their house again. On the 27th, Adi was sent by Baba south to Bangalore and then Ahmed Nagar. Meanwhile, Baba and Kaka with the musk, Bhagwan Nath left Jawalapur for Saharanapur. Kaka was completely overworked between attending single-handedly to Baba and looking after the must, but he managed. At Saharanapur, they found a man to take Bhagwan Nath back to his village. On Wednesday, 28 August, 1946, from six to nine o'clock in the morning, Baba contacted 1,500 lower middle-class men and women who Marich and Baidul had gathered. Each had been given a ticket with the word Prasad printed on it and had been informed to come to the public library in Jubilee Garden on the appointed day. Baba washed their feet, put his head on their feet, and then in another room, handed them his love gift of one rupee each in private. After this poor program, Baba left Saharanapur at 10 o'clock, accompanied by Baidul, Paka, and Erich, and returned to Niranjanpur by the afternoon. For the next two weeks until mid-September 1946, Baba remained in strict seclusion. Baidul was sent to gather information about musks in Hyderabad, Sukhor, Multan, and elsewhere. And Erich was sent to Simla to make arrangements there. At one point, Baba took the women Mandali to Hardwar for the Mela to see the gathering of thousands of sadhus. They stayed in a hotel for a few days before returning to Naranjanpur. On 10th oh. September, oh. Um, do you want me to stop, Marvin? Oh, well, we're in the middle of the page. Maybe you should finish the page, go ahead. Okay, okay. all right. On 10th September, 1946, Baba left Naranjanpur with Mehera, Mani, Meru, and Kitty for the hill resort of Simla. They spent two nights on the way at Ambala, where on the 11th, Baba spontaneously dictated to Erich, a time will come when the best of the Mandali members will give me up I shall be made to undergo the lowest of humiliations by a few persons. Three fourths of the world will then fall at my feet. A must will beat me, and that will be the crisis causing me to break my silence. I behave many times eccentrically in order to maintain the body. Otherwise, it tends to fall off. Previously, I dashed my head against something hard to maintain normal consciousness. Doing this is very impractical now. So I keep the ladies and the body I have to be engaged in sudden activities. A time is fast approaching. For my wait, wait, wait. Uh, Eva, hold it. You, you, you skipped a line. Oh, okay. So so I keep the ladies and boys. Oh, okay, thank you. So I keep the ladies and boys with me. That unlimited bliss tends to draw me to the infinite. To keep up the body, I have to be engaged in sudden activities. A time is fast approaching for my humiliation. Peter, the best of Christ's apostles gave him up. So will the Mandali do the same with me without it being their fault. 
I will be humiliated more degrade, degradingly, degradedly than Christ. My end will be brought about by a very few persons out of those few who will be my enemies. Hendu and Adi Sr. left Mayorbad together and arrived in Simla at midday on 12 September. Baba and the group arrived later that afternoon. Everyone stayed at the Royal Hotel where Baba and the Mandali had stayed the previous month. Baba, Kaka, and the women occupied the top floor and Erich, Pendu, and Adi another floor. Pendu and Adi were given the duty of finding an ideal boy and were engaged in this pursuit from morning to evening. They found one suitable candidate, but the man who promised to bring the boy to the hotel failed to turn up. Inevitably, whenever the Mandali would bring boys, Baba would send them away after giving them new clothes and prasad. Meanwhile, Kaka and Erich would locate mosques in the area whom Baba would contact. The women would go for a walk with Baba and occasionally to a movie or play. On the 23rd, Baba, the women, and Kaka left for Naranjanpur by private car at 3 p.m. Erich came the next day and Pendu and Adi were sent to Lahore to discover any musks whom Baidu might have missed. Baidu was instructed to return to Naranjanpur. For over a year, Bak Bakamai Dadachanji 48 had been fighting a losing battle with breast cancer and she was now fading fast. A telegram was sent to Baba through Papa Jesuwala at Pune, informing him of her deteriorating condition. Baba wired back, my will be done. Okay, we'll stop the reading here. Note the page number. And let me stop the recording. Five, 